welcome to the Hope for the Animals podcast, sponsored by Compassionate Living. I'm your host, Hope Bohannock, and you can find all our past shows and more information on our website, hopefortheanimalspodcast.org, and you can find my contact information there as well. Welcome to May, everyone. This month, May, is International Respect for Chickens Month, so we are going to focus in on chickens for both episodes this month, today with Aline Anello, who's using the law to help chickens. And we'll be getting into our conversation with her in just a bit. And then our next guest later in the month uh, for the next podcast will be Tara Hess with the Open Sanctuary Project. And Tara will be also presenting at our upcoming Humane Hoax Chicken webinar. Uh, We have a lot going on for chickens this month. So my organization, Compassionate Living, is co-hosting the third annual Humane Hoax Chicken webinar. It's coming up on Saturday. Saturday, May 21st. And as always, if you're hearing this after that date, the videos of each of the speakers will be available on Compassionate Living's YouTube page, as well as the humanehoax.org page, our Humane Hoax website, humanehoax.org. But if you are hearing this before May 21st, 2022, I hope that you will register for this free event and join us. I will put a link to the registration in the show notes. We organized this chicken webinar with the Triangle Chicken Advocates in North Carolina, and there's also sponsoring organizations, the Micro Sanctuary Resource Center, United Poultry Concerns, and Free From Harm. I'm really excited about this year's lineup of speakers. We're covering a lot of interesting angles this year, starting kind of broadly with the chicken industry and then uh, later in the webinar focusing in on chicken care and sanctuary care. Karen Davis of United Poultry Concerns will be speaking. Uh, She'll be speaking about the hidden world of agricultural research and how chickens are used in experiments in laboratories that are for and funded by big ag, trying to make it cheaper and easier to breed and torture and kill these poor birds. This is an aspect of the industry that we hardly ever talk about that really no one knows much about and is really critical uh, to the entire system. So it's really going to be interesting. Karen is an expert uh, in this area of uh, agricultural research. So this should be really, really interesting to hear about. And then my co-organizer for this webinar, Alistair Van Cleek, formerly known as Justin, they will be covering another important but not very well-known aspect of the exploitation of chickens, and they'll be talking about roosters. So the talk is called, Where Are Their Brothers? The Absent and Unwanted Rooster. So for every hen who is confined and kept for eggs, there was a baby male born, a baby male chick born. Uh, But you know, most don't make it beyond that point of being just a baby and are killed as babies. But the ones that do make it to adulthood, they are probably the most undesired and unwanted domesticated animal with the worst and, you know, the worst and unwarranted reputation, a bad reputation, but an unwarranted bad reputation. So Alistair is going to talk about their firsthand experience and expertise with roosters. So that should be really great. So please be sure to register for our Humane Hoax Chicken webinar on May 21st. Because our focus this month is on chickens for International Respect for Chickens Month, I want to say something about cage-free eggs. This is something that is just really taking off. This is a compromise that the industry is willing to make. (laughs) And looking at the numbers, in 2010, cage-free eggs were just 4% of the market. Just last, well, a couple years ago in 2020, that had risen to 28% of the market, and it's expected that cage-free eggs will be 70% of the market come the next four or five years. So this is happening. This transition to cage-free eggs is pretty inevitable at this point. 
So how all this came about is that animal activists have been exposing the horrors of egg-laying hens languishing in these horrible battery cages for decades now. And, you know, from undercover investigations and just walking, we used to be able to just walk into the facilities and look. I've done that a couple of times, but that was back in the 90s. I uh, can't really do that anymore. The chickens are crammed into these cages, stacked on top of one another, uh, you know, in these dark, awful, windowless warehouses, and um, it's 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 miserable. It is. It's it's arguably one of the most horrible confinement situations for farmed animals. So we put a lot of focus on that. We put a lot of emphasis on how horrible the battery cages are in the egg industry. And so the clever marketers representing the egg industry have responded. They have feigned concern (laughs) for the birds and they're doing away with the battery cages. So they are changing the industry. They're changing the story. They're changing the labels and changing consumers' conceptions of the chicken's experience. So instead of foregoing eggs, instead of just not buying eggs, shoppers now have a choice, a seemingly humane alternative, cage-free. You see the label now, you know, on the muffin at your coffee shop or at cartons in the store. But the reality for the birds is... The change is so minimal. The reality is really stark. I mean, most of these birds in cage-free operations still live in miserable, overcrowded buildings in what are called floor systems, where there's just thousands of birds overcrowded on the floor. Uh, There's a buildup of waste that burns their eyes and throats. They never see the sun or feel, you know, the the sun on their wings or experience a, a simple satisfying dust bath. Mortality rates have been shown to be higher in cage-free operations, and they all go to a brutal slaughter at a very young age. All that is still happening under the cage-free label. And while it's true that being confined in the battery cages was horrible for the hens, I think I think everyone can agree that it's good to get them out of the cages. I mean, any modicum of improvement is better than nothing for their, you know, their, their horrible, incredibly bleak lives. Uh, the problem is, though, that all the welfare issues for these birds that these birds face have been funneled through this one thing, the cage, which is now seemingly resolved if you buy cage-free eggs, right? So the perception is that the cage-free label, everything's fine, all's well for the birds, they're living a good life. Labels funnel the animal's existence down to just a couple of words, cage-free, when there's so much more going on, there's so much more complexity to their suffering. The other horrors that they face in egg production aren't even acknowledged. There's, you know, other frightening, horrifying things like being born in a metal drawer without the love and comfort of your mother, of your mother hen, and being thrust into a world of machinery and conveyor belts and needles giving injections and hot blades cutting your beak and being tossed around by uncaring workers like canned goods. This is still the experience of a chick that will be raised in a cage-free facility. No matter how they're kept, where they're kept, it's not profitable to keep a chicken alive beyond her best laying months, her best egg-laying months. So she is slaughtered at a very young age, in really the human equivalent of her teens. So when we hear about all the victories of these companies going cage-free, Please just take that with a grain of salt. And, you know, sure, yes, it's something, but it but to me it's far from a victory. It's possibly a slight improvement at best. But it needs to be known that even with a cage-free label, chickens still suffer. Cage-free doesn't mean cruelty-free. The cage-free label is misleading. And from the beginning of their lives to the end, there are still so many cruelties beyond the cage. Okay, so that's my cage-free rant 
for International Respect for Chickens Month. Let's have true respect for chickens and not uh, support cage-free or any of those labels and reduce or eliminate eggs from your diet. That is truly the only way to be completely cruelty-free and have true respect for chickens. So let's now bring in our guest and move to our conversation for the day. Okay, we are going to now bring in Aline Anello. She is the founder of Legal Impact for Chickens, a litigation nonprofit dedicated to fighting for farmed animals. Aline graduated from Harvard Law School. She clerked for a federal judge and then started litigating for animals. She's worked for PETA, the Animal Legal Defense Fund, the Good Food Institute, and she is committed to helping chickens to honor the memories of her two beloved avian family members, Conrad and Zeke. Welcome to the podcast, Aline. Thank you so much for having me, Hope. I love this podcast and it's a huge honor to get to be part of it. Oh, thanks. Wonderful. Well, we're glad to have you. And we usually like to start just to kind of get to know you with your vegan origin story. So when and why did you go vegan? It was a really gradual process that took basically my entire life from when I was five to when I was like a junior in college. Basically that whole time I had guilt for not being vegan. Even before I knew the word vegan, I had guilt about participating in something that was hurting somebody. And so whenever I think about being vegan, that's one thing that makes me really happy is like ever since then I haven't had that guilt anymore and I felt much better. So the first thing was when I was around five, I remember that my older sister, Farron, would talk about not wanting to eat meat and feeling bad about it. And my parents would make us eat it because they thought it was important for our health and they were worried about us. Um, But that was the first time it entered my head that maybe meat isn't good. And then when I was in sixth grade, I must have been exposed to material from PETA, even though I didn't know what PETA was at the time, because I remember learning that pigs are very similar to dogs. And I had dogs, Rover and Nathan, that were really close to me. And I didn't want to ever hurt dogs or anyone like them. So I also heard the slogan, pigs are our friends, not our food. And I started a club with my friends at school called Pigs Are Our Friends, Not Our Food, where we would all sit together at lunch and not eat pigs. Uh, But I was still eating other animals. When I was 11, my parents bought me Conrad as a present, my first bird. And I really loved him. And so eventually when I was in middle school, I started realizing that chicken is from a bird as well. And I didn't want to hurt birds. And so I was really upset about thinking that I, that I was eating somebody that was similar to Conrad. And so I stopped eating chickens in middle school, but I was still eating beef and fish. And then when I was in high school, my friend showed all of us, all of our high school friends, a video called Meet Your Meat, which is from PETA also, even though I still didn't know what PETA was. And the video was my first time seeing how animals that we eat are raised. And I was so upset because I found out they're treated really badly. And I didn't know that up until that point, I had always basically been lied to by adults and been told that the animals we eat are treated really well, and then they're killed. When in reality, I found out they're treated terribly and then killed. So I got really upset to learn that I shouldn't even say I was lied to. I think the adults didn't know what was happening because this was when the internet was just start, when YouTube was just starting and people started being able to see undercover investigation. So I went and told my mom about the video and I was really upset. And we kind of stayed up all night crying that night because she was really worried for me because she believed that it was important to eat meat for your health. So she was really worried that if I didn't eat meat, I would get sick. So I kept eating meat for a couple more years until the summer before my senior year in high school, my mom told me, I know you don't like eating meat and I know you're going to stop eating meat in college. And so you might as well stop now while I'm here to watch over you and make sure you're okay. So I got to go vegetarian uh, and I was vegetarian for my senior year in high school. And obviously I was super healthy and nothing went wrong. And then I was vegetarian in college. um, But in college, I learned about battery cages 
and I got involved in doing uh, cage-free activism to try to protest putting birds in battery cages because, again, I was thinking of my bird and I didn't want him to ever be hurt. And so I didn't want other birds to be hurt. And that led me to meeting other animal rights activists and to finding out about the group Vegan Outreach. So I wanted to support Vegan Outreach because I really liked that they were standing up for animals. And it never occurred to me that I wasn't vegan (laughs) and I was still eating milk and eggs. So one day I was leafleting with Vegan Outreach and I was with this wonderful man named Brian Groupe. And he asked me something about like, why aren't you vegan? You know, you're leafleting at Vegan Outreach. Why aren't you vegan? And my answer was, well, I really love pizza. And this was back before, before I had ever had vegan pizza. Now I still love pizza. I had vegan pizza last night. But at the time, I thought, if you're vegan, you can't have pizza. <laughs> and so Brian just stopped leafleting and stared at me like confused. And he was like, you like pizza so much that you want a baby cow to be taken away from his mother? And I was just like, I guess not that much. I mean, I like pizza, but not that much. Right. So then I was like, I guess I'm vegan now. And then ever since that conversation, I've been vegan. Wow. So I'm really grateful to Brian, even though he says he has no memory of that conversation. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's interesting how, so, you know, I hear this all the time from a lot of my guests that they had, that they had times in their childhood that they connected to animals somehow. And I did too. I, I have the same story. And it's interesting how you had the kind of species by species uh, connection going on. So you stopped eating pigs because they were like dogs and you had dogs, you knew dogs. Same with your new pet bird. So then you connected to chickens. It's so interesting that um, familiarity, you know, that when we know know a companion animal or can make that connection to some animal. And then we connect it to that species that's being farmed and bred and killed for our food. It's, it's so interesting how that can happen even uh, on an unconscious level or on a, like a, you know, just a childlike level that you don't even, you aren't told, but you can just see it. You feel it, you know, right? Yeah. 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 And so, and you talked about your, your bird, uh, Conrad, and I wanted to ask you about Conrad and Zeke. I believe they were cockatiels, right? Yeah. 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 Because they, you have them in your bio and we've talked a little about them and they are part of what inspired you on this path. Do you want to talk about them a little bit? Yeah. So, so Conrad was a present my parents bought when I was 11 and I had him for 22 years until last year, 2021. Wow. And he was awesome. The idea of him being a present is like absurd to me because he was someone, not something. He had opinions and feelings and complaints and desires. My favorite thing to do with him, which was very rare, was when he was in the mood, he really liked to have his head pet. So he would like put his head back down on my shoulder and want me to pet him. And that was like the best feeling in the world. And he would move his head because he wanted you to pet certain parts of him. So the parts that felt really good, he would like move to get you to touch. He loved people and he loved company and he hated being alone. And when I was a kid, I would go to school and he would be alone in my room and he would like scream when I was leaving. And it made me so sad. I used to feel so guilty all the time to have him be alone because I knew that he would just be at peace if he was in my company. And if he wasn't, he was really anxious and upset. Um, And I, I think that's because in nature cockatiels, I learned are flock animals. They're never alone. And it's actually probably dangerous for them to be alone because they are so weak and they could be like, maybe they would be preyed on, or they also probably work together to find food and water. And if they were alone, they might not be able to. So I had him for many years. And then I always felt guilty that he was alone, but I also didn't really know what to do about it because as a kid, I decided it was wrong to buy animals because I realized that he should be with his mother and that his mother must be wondering where he is and missing him. And so I didn't want to buy another animal and I didn't know that there was another option. But then as I got older, I learned about animal shelters and I learned that they have all sorts of animals in them, even birds, even cockatiels. But I still like hesitated to get another bird you know, because I had all these fears about it. Like, well, what if they don't get along or something? Or what if he doesn't like other birds? He just likes people. So finally, 
when I was in law school, so maybe six years ago, I decided I really should adopt another bird to keep Conrad company because I was, I was trying to be with him as much as possible, but I still needed to go to class and leave him. And so I went onto petfinder.com and I searched for cockatiel and I specifically wanted an older cockatiel. I found that there was like this one cockatiel named Zeke and there was no picture of him and it said he was elderly. And that was all it said. And I was like, okay, this is what I'm going to do for Conrad. So I had to drive an hour to uh, one of the MSPCA shelters and I went into the back and there was this little cage with an amazing little angel bird in it. And, and he like threw himself at the wall of the cage to be close to me. And he just started like chirping to me, like looking in my eyes and chirping to me. And I immediately was in love. Aww. And that was Zeke. I thought I was getting him like for Conrad's sake. But as soon as I saw him, I was like, I love this bird and they never want to be separated from him. And I don't even care what Conrad thinks. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I brought him home and he like chirped to me the whole way in the car ride. Like I was supposed to keep him and Conrad separated for like a week. That was best practices. But as soon as I let him out of the box, he was really curious to hear what was happening in the other room. And I didn't want to stop him. So he flew in and saw Conrad and they talked to each other and they were together for five years. They never like cuddled, but, and they would fight sometimes, but they really liked each other's company and they would like talk back and forth. And Conrad was never upset about being left again. Like he stopped screaming when I would leave. He would like kind of chirp goodbye, but he wouldn't freak out. Aww. So I'm so glad I adopted Zeke yeah. for my sake and for Conrad's sake and for Zeke's sake. Like he needed us. So yeah, that was Conrad and Zeke. But unfortunately in 2021, they both died. Both of them, one after the other got diagnosed with cancer and we tried to do everything we could. It's the worst thing that ever happened to me. I loved them both so much and I felt really lost when they died. Aww. The death of a companion animal for vegans, for anyone really, I mean, but maybe vegans especially, can be so, so hard. So I, I, um, my heart goes out to you and I'm sorry for your loss. Thank you, Hope. Yeah, yeah. So you're a lawyer and you went to Harvard Law School. So tell us about your path to law. What got you into law? Why were you drawn to law? Uh, tell us a little about that journey. So after college, I worked at PETA, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. And I loved my job there. It was super fun. But over time, I felt like what I was doing got a little repetitive and I was wanting more intellectual stimulation. And I started paying a lot of attention to PETA's legal team. I felt like every other week, Ingrid Newkirk, who runs PETA, would send an email saying like, everyone go downstairs. We're having a celebration. There'll be cake and champagne. The legal team just won this lawsuit or the legal team just saved this animal or something great the legal team had done. So I was like, they're the coolest. I kind of want to be them. Um, <laughs> and... And meanwhile, my dad and my brother and my sister are all lawyers. And so in my head, the idea that I could be a lawyer if I wanted to was always present, but I had just never really been interested in law because I guess I just didn't really get, it just seemed boring until I saw the PETA lawyers and they were not boring. They were awesome. So, <laughs> um, and so I applied to law school. Okay. And you got into Harvard Law and you clerked for a federal judge when did the connection to animals happen then? How did you get back into being a lawyer for animals? I always wanted to use the law for animals. I remember that when I told people at PETA I was leaving to go to law school, some of them made comments about, well, that's sad because you should be staying in the fight for animals. And I felt like, no, of course I would stay in the fight for animals. It never has entered in my head to not stay in the fight for animals. But, but then that thought would reverberate in my head, like, what if law school sucks me in this other direction away from animals? So I did have that fear. But throughout law school, I ran the school chapter of the Student Animal Legal Defense Fund. And I did internships at animal law organizations every summer. And really, the only time when I had a full time job, not helping animals was when I was clerking. So I always knew that after I clerked, I really wanted to get back into helping animals. I basically spent the beginning of the clerkship like furiously applying for animal law jobs. At that time, maybe still now, they were really, really hard to get. I think luckily there's more and more animal law jobs nowadays. And my organization, Legal Impact for Chickens, 
hopes to be a job creator, but I was really freaked out that I wouldn't get an animal law job and that I would have to just be a boring regular lawyer. But I did. I applied to do a fellowship at the Animal Legal Defense Fund. And I got a call from Matthew Liebman saying like, yeah, we want you to be our fellow. And I think I started crying in the mm-hmm. court. I was like in the chambers of the judge and I started crying, I think, and like told my co-clerks from the judge and everybody was like so happy for me. That's awesome. I love it. I love it. And so, and you mentioned your organization, Legal Impact for Chickens. So I would love to pivot and and ask you about that. So you worked for Animal Legal Defense Fund and, but then now you have started your own nonprofit. So, so why did you decide to uh, start your own uh, nonprofit, Legal Impact for Chickens? So the, the answer to this sort of reminds me of the question about why I went vegan, where for a decade or a decade and a half, I was eating meat and other animal products and feeling guilty about it. And then I finally had something that like allowed me to change. So similarly, ever since I started working at PETA, I would often think to myself, wouldn't it be really cool if I started my own animal rights group? Because I would just have ideas about how I wanted to do things. Like I started seeing that a lot of people in animal rights, I I started seeing that it's really hard to get a job in animal rights, first of all. So the idea that somebody could be a job creator and create more animal rights jobs, that always appealed to me because I saw that we would get so many applicants and have to reject most of them. And then I also saw that a lot of people really had bad experiences working in animal rights. Like they would enjoy helping animals and it would be fun, but they might feel like they were criticized a lot or like they weren't appreciated. Whereas I am a huge extrovert. I love people. And I think that for me, no matter what I'm doing, I'm always focusing on are the people around me having fun. So I think if I were to start an animal rights group, um, maybe I could do a better job of making sure that my employees are having fun and feeling appreciated and respected and all the good ways people want to feel. That said, fast forward, I don't know that I actually am good at that now that I've started an animal rights group, but I (laughs) believed that I would be good at it. Um, well, you have the intention. So that's, that's I have really the intention. Good. <laughs> yes. But I've learned that it's way harder than I thought it was when I was yeah. just an employee. So then I kept having thoughts like that. Like when I was in law school, I would think, oh, we could use this legal doctrine for animals. And I don't know if any group currently is doing that. And maybe one day if I started my own group, we would. And then when I worked at the Animal Legal Defense Fund, I would have thoughts about there's so many amazing things about the Animal Legal Defense Fund. But anytime there was something I wished was different, I would always think of it in terms of like, if I had my group, I would do it different. So one thing is the Animal Legal Defense Fund is huge and they have multiple different issues that they work on, farmed animal issues and other issues. And they do multiple kinds of work, litigation and other kinds. And occasionally what's best for one of those other issues might not be what's best for uh, litigation or farmed animals. And because I'm most passionate about helping farmed animals because there's so many of them, And because I'm most passionate about litigation because it's just a really fun way of doing things. And I think it could be really impactful. I would always think like, what if we had a group that was 100% litigation and 100% farmed animal work? Could they do things that none of the current groups can do? So yeah, it was always something I fantasized about. And that kind of reminds me of the question of why I went vegan, because in both cases, there was a long lead up between when I started thinking, wouldn't it be cool to do things differently? Like, wouldn't it be nice if I didn't eat animals? Or wouldn't it be nice if I had my own nonprofit? And then the day when I actually did it. And I like to point that out because if there's any listeners who are like me, where they have some desire that seems really impossible, I think it's good to know that it might be possible if you just keep wanting it for long enough. Like if you keep wanting to go vegan for long enough, in my opinion, you will eventually go vegan because there's all these barriers and they will slowly kind of crumble one by one until there's no barrier and you realize like, yeah, I can be vegan today. Or if you want to start your own group, there might be barriers, you might be unsure, but over time the barriers will crumble and one day you'll just realize, oh, I am sure and today is the day. The impetus that made me realize it was time to start my group is when Conrad died. So Zeke died first and then Conrad died. And when Conrad died, I felt like really unsure what I was doing with my life. I just reassessed everything and suddenly the idea of being cautious seemed ridiculous because 
the worst thing that could have ever happened to me had already happened in my mind. And so I thought, why would I be cautious anymore? I should just do my dream and start a nonprofit today. Wow. I love that. I can completely relate. I had for many years, similar feelings for years. I've worked for national nonprofits and, you know, that feeling of i I would do it differently or I would do something, you know, I I have this idea and I would do it differently. And I think that that is the hallmark or, or a sign of a good leader, you know, that we were meant to be leaders of our own organizations because, you know, you have vision, you have ideas and visions that can be implemented in different ways. So, yeah. So I think that that's really the sign of a great leader. I'm glad that you took the leap to do that. I also have done that just now getting my nonprofit up to, uh, you know, me full-time focus, focusing on it uh, and taking it national uh, compassionate living. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I totally understand that. I have uh, had similar feelings through the years and also too around caring for our employees. That's certainly a vision I have too, if I can ever have them. So (laughs) yeah. Hope, I wanted to say I was so excited when I saw that you were doing Compassionate Living full-time I love United Poultry Concerns. They're one of my favorite animal rights groups. So it's, I guess, in a sense, sad that they lost you. But I just was so happy that you're starting your own thing because I think you're such a kind person and that the animal movement needs more kindness. I mean, we're all kind because we're trying to help animals, but you're like kind in this gentle way where you're kind to everyone around you. And yeah, I'm really, really happy that you did that. And I think that's really going to be good for the movement. Aw, thank you so much. Thanks so much. So we're both venturing out and doing this, and I wish you the best of luck as well. Thank you, Hope. Yeah. So why are you focusing specifically on chickens? The name of your nonprofit is Legal Impact for Chickens. So tell me why you're focusing on chickens. Yeah, so there are two reasons. There's like the kind of intellectual reason which explains why people should focus on chickens. And then there's the emotional reason, which explains why I personally find it very satisfying to focus on chickens. So from an intellectual perspective, as you know, Hope, there are around 9 billion chickens abused and killed for food in the U.S. every year, and way, way, way more if you look at other countries. And the reason I say abused and killed is that the way that chickens use for meat in the U.S., And the way that chickens use for eggs in the U.S. are treated is really horrible. The birds used for eggs, a lot of times they're kept in these cages so small that they can't even spread their wings. It's really common for them to have their beaks cut off. And beaks are are probably one of the most sensitive parts of a bird. I mean, imagine having your mouth cut off. They have a lot of nerve endings in their beak. And a lot of baby male chicks are killed as soon as they're born just because they were bred to be in the egg industry and they can't lay eggs because they're male. So the egg industry is horrific. And then the meat industry is also horrific. It's really common for birds used for meat to be bred to be so big that they can't even stand under their own weight. The way that they're killed is usually really gruesome. Like it's really common to use this method called shackle and hoist where birds are dumped into these transport kit rates and then carried for a really long way to get to the slaughterhouse and then dumped out and then hung upside down by their feet, which is horrible. Like it would be horrible for anyone to be hung upside down by your feet. Imagine how much you would hate it, but it's like more horrible for a bird because they are just terrified. They're flapping their wings to try to get their balance. A bird would never be upside down. Like that's just not a way that a bird would ever be. They're pretty much always standing up. Most birds would never even lay down. They stand up all the time. They sleep standing up. And I don't think a chicken would ever voluntarily lay down. They're always right side up. So being upside down is terrible. And then they go through this conveyor belt and they're supposed to have their throat slit, which is pretty bad. But a lot of them duck and don't get their throat slit. And then what happens to them is even worse because they may end up going under into this bath of scalding water where they get burned when they're still conscious. The whole thing is like horrible, horrible, horrible. If you are not convinced it's horrible, You can just Google undercover investigations about chickens. But yeah, that's the intellectual reason to focus on chickens, just that they're treated so badly and there's so many of them and we should do something about it. But then the personal emotional reason for me is that I've always been really drawn to birds ever since I met Conrad when I was 11. 
And I've always been very concerned about birds ever since I got to know Conrad. Also because I started Legal Impact for Chickens right after Conrad died. And so for me, being able to tell myself every day that I'm working to help birds, it's like a way to stand up and keep going and feel good about what I'm doing. So you've mentioned that there's two different strategies that you want to use for legal impact for chickens, two different uh, methods or ways that you're going to go about helping the birds. So can you elaborate on what those are, what those two different strategies are that you're going to be uh, focusing on? Yeah. So we, our main focus is private civil enforcement of criminal anti-cruelty and anti-neglect laws. We're based in the U.S. And in the U.S., every state has a criminal or penal law against animal cruelty and neglect. And these are laws that say things like it is illegal to cruelly mistreat an animal or cruelly maim an animal or deprive an animal of necessary food, water, or sustenance. And these are laws that are really good, in my opinion. They're very broadly written. And these are the kind of laws where if you hear somebody getting arrested for beating their dog, this is probably the type of law they would have been arrested for. Mm -hmm. um, so these are the laws that like protect our dogs and cats and other animals that we keep at home. So a big goal of Legal Impact for Chickens is to apply these laws to farmed animals and to do that ourselves without relying on the government. In several states, including California, which is a huge state, there's technically no exemption in the statute for agriculture. So theoretically, if you just read the statute, it says all these things that are illegal to do to an animal. And a lot of those things are happening every single day in the meat industry and in the egg industry. So it is really common for, like I mentioned earlier, for people that work in animal agriculture to cut the beaks off of baby chicks. And that's very painful and cruel. And it's a form of naming because it's permanent. And that is probably illegal in a lot of states that have this law against cruelly naming an animal. However, the laws are just really not enforced when it comes to agriculture, particularly when it comes to large scale agriculture. So it is really, really, really rare for any police officer to investigate any agricultural facility to see if they're committing cruelty to animals. When, when I have heard of the investigations, it's almost always a very, very small scale facility where maybe the officer could see the mistreatment from the road. And usually it would be like one person raising animals they're going to use. But when it comes to a big company like Tyson raising and killing 2 billion animals a year, no one is checking how they treat the animals if, except for animal activists. And then even when animal activists do undercover investigations to try to show how animals are being mistreated in ag the agriculture industry, the, and they tell the police, it is very rare for the police to do anything about it. And when the police do do something about it, they almost always focus on uh, low-level individual workers rather than focusing on the CEO, the top that are creating this whole system. Similarly, animal activists often at PETA and the Animal Legal Defense Fund and Animal Outlook will take it one step further. They'll actually contact prosecutors and say, usually you get tips from the police, but the police are not helping. So here we are to tell you this is happening. It's illegal. Do something about it. And unfortunately, even when they do that, it's very rare for prosecutors to prosecute. Um, prosecutors have this thing called prosecutorial discretion in most states, which means basically they don't have to prosecute if they don't want to. So that, that was my focus on states that have no exemption in their statute for agriculture. Most states have some kind of exemption in their statute for agriculture, but the exemption is almost never a complete exemption. So it'll say something like, quote unquote, customary agricultural practices are exempt or quote unquote, commonly accepted agricultural practices are exempt from the animal cruelty law. But if you look at a lot of the suffering that happens to birds and other animals used for food, a lot of it is not customary and not commonly accepted. For example, killing baby chicks when they're born just because they don't produce eggs and they were bred to produce eggs, that's not accepted. If you, I'm sure most listeners don't find that acceptable. And if you ask your friends, I'm sure most of your friends will say that's not acceptable. So it's not commonly accepted. So in my opinion, that would be an example of illegal animal cruelty, even in states that have an exemption for commonly accepted agricultural practices. Mm -hmm. But again, 
in those states, which is a majority of states, police do not investigate industrial animal cruelty for the most part, and prosecutors don't prosecute it even when animal groups do a lot of work to try to get the police and the prosecutors to prosecute. So that's applying criminal laws to to farmed animals. I believe that criminal laws technically do apply, but they are not in practice applied by the government most of the time. And then the other issue is- I I just, I want to say really quick, I I love that because- I remember when I was first, you know, thinking about going vegan and and uh, vegan issues and stuff. I, I remember thinking, well, but if someone beat their dog, they'd be arrested. So it mm-hmm. can't it can't be. Uh, there's there's laws, right? There's laws against animal mm-hmm. cruelty. So so they can't be treating the the animals that bad. I remember thinking that, and not mm-hmm. realizing that there is this these exemptions that there is this overlook by law enforcement and the government and everyone just mm-hmm. ignores and farmed animals are treated differently under the law. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. e- even though, like you said, they, there is protection. It's just being ignored. Exactly. Uh, yeah. It's fascinating. That's great. I, I love that you're tackling that. Good. So, yeah. So basically the first issue that I wanted to explain about our strategy is that we do believe, as you just mentioned, there are some legal protections that are not being applied. Then the second part of the strategy is I'm talking about criminal laws and penal laws. And usually criminal or penal laws are enforced by the government. So a lot of people think, well, if the government isn't enforcing it, there's nothing we can do. But it is possible that there are maybe ways for private people to enforce these criminal laws. So this is not an idea that I invented. It's an idea that I don't know who invented it, but it's at least been popularized by the Animal Legal Defense Fund. And I learned about it from them back before law school when I was still working at PETA. Basically, the idea is that there's a few legal doctrines that let you sue somebody as a plaintiff privately, which is like what you do when uh, if your landlord doesn't give you your security deposit back, you like sue them. You don't need the government to sue them. You do it. There are a few doctrines that let you sue somebody privately for breaking a criminal law. And so some people at the Animal Legal Defense Fund have been working on the question of, could we use that for animals? And there have been actually some successes, like the Animal Legal Defense Fund brought this really cool law against a small petting zoo in Iowa called Cricket Hollow Zoo that was like terribly mistreating animals, keeping them in these dirty cages. And the Animal Legal Defense Fund sued saying that it was a quote unquote nuisance, which is a legal doctrine that in some states lets you sue anyone who's doing anything illegal and get them to stop. And so it worked. The court said like, yeah, they're committing animal cruelty and neglect, and that is a nuisance. And therefore you plaintiffs, private plaintiffs can sue and make these people give up their animals and stop cruelty. So that happened this one time in in Iowa, I think that that kind of thing can and should be used for farmed animals because there are so many more farmed animals that need help. So our main focus is when I say it's private civil enforcement of criminal laws, that's what I mean. Finding creative mechanisms like nuisance law or others where you can go into court as a civil private plaintiff and say, these animals were harmed, it was illegal, and I believe that I have the right to do something about it. All this stuff we're trying to do is what's called impact litigation, which is when lawyers are trying to help change the law through litigation. So you're bringing cases that you maybe don't know if you're going to win necessarily, but you think you could win. And if you did win, it would create an avenue for more lawyers to bring more cases. And it would also just send a message to whatever the industry or whoever you're targeting that this behavior will get you in trouble. So you should improve your behavior. Our other focus is holding companies to their animal welfare commitments. So you may have seen that over the years, a lot of companies have pledged that they're going to go cage free in five years or that they're going to stop breeding birds to be uh, so large that they break their bones under their weight in five years, some kind of promise. And often the companies make good on their promise and that's a big win for animals, but sometimes they don't make good on their promise. And so we want to establish that you can't get away from being criticized by making a promise that you're then going to break. That if you try to deal with a problem you're having by making a promise, you have to then make good on your promise. So that's the other kind of loss that we want to bring. Oh, okay. Okay. 
And so, and I, I know that you're working on a case specifically around Costco and their treatment of chickens that are bred and slaughtered for meat, I believe. Can you tell us more about that, what you're working on there? So with Costco right now, all we're doing is trying to get more information about how Costco treats its birds. So Costco is a huge store. I I think most people probably know what it is. They sell, it's like a warehouse store and they sell like discounted items from food to furniture. And some people may know, but some people may not know that in around 2019, approximately, Costco also became a sort of like a chicken meat company in a sense. They built a slaughterhouse and a hatchery and they got a bunch of people and trained them. I, I want to say they trained them how to raise chickens, except I don't believe that they trained them in like a humane way to raise chickens, but they trained them in like the Costco way to raise chickens. <laughs> um, yeah. And they now basically breed, raise, and slaughter. I think it's around 100 million chickens a year, which they then sell in their stores. So this makes them unique because most of the time when you go to a retailer and you buy something or you buy meat, most of the time the retailer bought the meat from someone else. And that's what Costco used to do, but now they are doing it themselves. And so another animal protection group, Mercy for Animals, you might have seen, came out with this undercover investigation last year showing how Costco is really mistreating the birds that it's raising for me. And so, so far, we're just trying to get more information about that. Costco is a publicly traded corporation, which means anyone can buy or sell its shares. And as a result, a lot of people own shares in Costco. Even a lot of people who might be vegan or who might be very concerned about the treatment of animals used for food and who would probably never buy a share in a company like Tyson. Because a lot of people don't realize that Costco basically is a meat company, or maybe they bought the shares in Costco before Costco became basically a meat company. And so we have two clients that are both people like that. They're actually, I think, both vegan. At a minimum, they're both vegetarian. And they bought shares in Costco, not thinking of it as being a meat company. In one case, I think might have even bought shares before Costco was a meat company. And then they found out about how Costco has treated its animals and they're really upset about it. And so shareholders have certain rights. And one of the rights they have is to submit a books and records request where they say, I want to see what this corporation is up to and get more information about the corporation because technically they're an investor in the corporation. And so one of the reasons you can request to see books and records is if there's an allegation of misconduct. And in this case, these shareholders that are our clients are concerned that Costco may be committing misconduct by illegally abusing or neglecting chickens. And so we just submitted this formal request to Costco saying that these shareholders want to exercise their rights to see what Costco is up to when it comes to birds. All right. So this month is International Respect for Chickens Month, and we have our chicken webinar coming up uh, later in May. And that's why I wanted to have you on, because you have started this nonprofit that focuses on chickens. It's wonderful to see so much more energy around chickens in the uh, animal advocacy spaces. So I just wanted to ask you about chickens and your connection to chickens, your thoughts about chickens. Uh, do you have anything you'd like to share uh, about chickens? Yeah, so I think chickens are super cool. Um, uh, me too. <laughs> I, yeah, so there was this one time I met this really, really cool rooster and it sticks with me because he was so kind and caring. And um, sometimes roosters get a bad rap and I always think of this guy when people sit, talk about roosters. So I was visiting a farm sanctuary and the caregiver gave us all grapes cut in half and chickens love grapes. And so the caregiver said, watch what happens if you give the grapes one at a time to the rooster. So we gave one grape to the rooster and then he went and gave it to one of the hens. And then he came back for another grape. We gave him another grape and he went and gave it to a different hen. And he did that until all the grapes were gone. He didn't eat any of them, but he made sure all the hens got a grape. And I thought that was just so sweet and selfless. And it's just like 
that rooster was a really cool rooster and there's birds out there like looking out for each other. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, it's like the rooster was a caregiver uh, mm-hmm. caring for the hens. I love that. I love that. That's great. Yeah, it is. It is so sad that roosters get such a bad rap, you know, that they are seen as aggressive and violent and mean and that they'll always fight with each other. And and you hear from farm sanctuary folks that that's that's that is really not true, uh, you know, that they are brave and compassionate and courageous. And certainly we can get along with each other. There's certain depending situations, but for the most part, you know, roosters are, they're amazing creatures. So I I love that story. Yeah. So Aline, what gives you hope for the future? One thing that I'm so excited about right now is what's going on in Chile. Um, I don't know if your listeners are already aware, but it's crazy stuff happening there. It it seems like Chile is probably going to add something to its constitution about animal protection or kind of about animal rights. There is this really cool nonprofit. uh, I'm bad at Spanish, but I think its name is pronounced Vegetarianos Hoy. It's spelled V-E-G-E-T-A-R-I-A-N-O-S space H-O-Y. And they are really, really cool. I feel like they should be getting way more attention and credit than they are. So they had this movement to add something into the Chilean constitution saying that animals are sentient beings. And they got it approved by 106 votes in favor with only 31 against and 19 abstentions. That happened um, on, in March 25th. This is an English translation of what it says, but apparently it says, Animals are subject to special protection. The state will protect them, recognizing their sentience and their right to live a life free of mistreatment. And so it's not final yet. They still need to, I guess, have a plebiscite to make the new constitution the law of the land, but they're on track. So cool. And it makes me feel like amazing things are happening. And the people I hang out with who are almost all American don't even like know or talk about some of the really cool things that are happening. Yeah, I agree. It's really amazing what's happening internationally. And we don't really pay attention to it in the U.S. You know, we're so uh, U.S. focused and uh, don't really pay attention. And there's some really amazing stuff happening for animals, for veganism, uh, vegan food spaces and, and, uh, options and all kinds of stuff, uh, internationally. So that's, that's really hopeful. Yeah, I so agree. And I love that you always ask your guests what gives them hope, because I think we all need to focus on the amazing things that are happening so that we can keep our head up and keep fighting. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I mean, as, as vegans, as activists, as caring people in the world, you have to have hope. (laughs) You have to have that hope that we can create a future that we all want to live in. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. animals included. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's been really wonderful to talk to you. Thank you so much for all the work you're doing for starting Legal Impact for Chickens. I wish you the best of luck and uh, and yeah, keep us posted on on your progress. And thank you so much for being on. Thank you so much. The coolest thing ever to get to be on this podcast. Thank you, Hope. Thank you for listening to the Hope for the Animals podcast, sponsored by Compassionate Living. Just a reminder that it is May, and that means it's International Respect for Chickens Month. So please take the time to educate yourself about issues related to chickens, and I have a great way to do just that. Join us for our Humane Hoax Chicken webinar on Saturday, May 21st. As I have already mentioned in this episode, we have a fantastic lineup of speakers this year, including our next podcast guest that you'll be hearing from later in the month, Tara Hess of the Open Sanctuary Project. So you'll be hearing her in the next podcast episode, but she will also be a presenter at the webinar. If you are hearing about this whole thing after the date of uh, May 21st, the videos for each of the speakers will be available on on the Compassionate Living YouTube page, as well as humanehoax.org. 
But if you can, please register and join us on May 21st. It will be informative and inspiring and we'll give our time, our energy, our our entire day to the chickens, to these delightful, cheerful, vibrant birds that deserve our attention. So I hope you will register today for this webinar, this free webinar, and I'll have links in the show notes. You can help us spread the word by sharing this podcast with your friends and on your social media pages. Be sure to give us a five-star rating if you're listening on an app. And if you can, join us on Patreon and help us out with a small monthly donation. I'm working on some fun merch that we'll have ready soon for all those joining us as patrons on Patreon. So check out our Patreon page. And I just want to say, I I appreciate you all so much to have listeners out there that want to hear hours of information on chickens and other farmed animals. I just love you. I love you all so much that, that you want to hear about the sweet, sentient beings on this planet that, that so few others care about. It gives me hope. It really gives me hope that we are a strong and growing community of compassionate people that care, that care about the planet, that care about other people, that care about animals and, and seeing how all these oppressions connect. And, and I hope that you are learning about and embracing the deep importance and the meaningful and significant value of living vegan.